Hey guys, Tyler here. Star Trek, like many other science fiction franchises, is known for uh, being populated by lots of humanoid-looking aliens. Often members of species we meet on screen are played by actors with a certain shade of body paint or with facial ridge makeup. But even in the original series, multiple attempts were made, at least occasionally, to depict non-humanoid aliens. One fantastic example, in my opinion, is the Tholian species. Having appeared in only three episodes of Star Trek uh, over five decades, in addition to 14 other mentions and dialogue, the Tholians are nonetheless what I'd consider a major Alpha Quadrant power, and their unique crystalline structure makes them stand out even compared to other non-humanoid species. In today's video, I'll discuss what we know about the Tholians' biology, as well as their history and culture, and compare them to our expectations about silicon-based life in our universe. I'll also speculate about their apparent involvement in the Temporal Cold War, and what the future might hold for their relations with the Federation and other powers. This is everything we know about the Tholians. As Dr. Phlox, or rather his mirror counterpart, remarks, Tholians have rather extreme life support requirements. They tend to thrive in temperatures registering 480 Kelvin, though when exposed to temperatures below 380 Kelvin, their reddish-brown mineral-like shells, or carapaces, tend to fracture, causing intense pain. Below that, they shatter. A murky fluid also flows through their carapaces and presumably carries out metabolic processes. They have six legs attached to their torso in a radially symmetrical pattern. This arrangement of legs and feet, accompanied by joints analogous to humanoid knees, allows them to move quickly in any direction. They also have two arms with joints analogous to elbows and wrists and multi-fingered hands on the ends of each arm, allowing them to manipulate objects. Like many other intelligent species, their head is atop their torso, and they have glowing jewel-like sensory organs that, while never explicitly stated to be eyes, likely serve a similar function. Oh, and they also produce silk, which is a prized commodity in the Alpha Quadrant. Tholians are not the only life forms in Star Trek whose biochemistries function on an element besides carbon, but that they are in fact silicon-based specifically is a notion formulated by puppeteer Mike Miner, who designed the first Tholian seen on screen, La Skeen, in the original series episode, The Tholian Web. Silicon has long been discussed as a possible alternative to carbon for biochemistry due to both elements' similarities. They share many chemical properties and are in the same group on the periodic table, both having four valence electrons, electrons in their outer shell, and being able to form molecules large enough to transmit biological information. While there are fewer types of atoms that silicon can bond with compared to carbon, silicon oxygen bonds, or silicones, as in the stuff used in caulk, are expected to be more stable than hydrocarbons in sulfuric acid environments. Now, uh, we don't know if Tholians actually use sulfuric acid per se in uh, their biochemistry, but silicones would be better suited to withstand intense pressures and temperatures on very hot planets. The cosmic abundance of carbon versus silicon, such as in molecules identified in the interstellar medium, is roughly 10 to 1. This suggests that silicon-based life is pretty rare throughout the universe, which makes sense. But if there are roughly 1 million in-class worlds in Star Trek's Milky Way, then there could be up to 100,000 planets in our galaxy with conditions conducive to silicon-based life. In fact, believe it or not, there's actually a type of algae called diatoms that make use of silicon in their anatomy. Diatom cell walls are made of silica, aka silicon dioxide or quartz, the same molecule that makes up most sand grains on Earth. Silica is a non-ionic compound in the silicate family, which uh, includes minerals found in Earth's crust and mantle, as well as plenty of other terrestrial planets, moons, and asteroids. Thus, it would not be totally inaccurate to uh, refer to the Tholians and other silicon-based life forms as living rocks, 
or at least living crystals. The Tholians are also shown being able to emit various forms of radiation, which they use to communicate over small distances. This is in addition to their normal form of communication, which consists of a series of chirps and clicks. In this way, the Tholians are able to interact with the natural electrical fields of their surroundings, nourishing themselves through a form of anaerobic respiration. Information on the Tholian lifespan is apparently limited to novels, but these novels indicate that Tholians reproduce rather quickly. However, this reproduction is more akin to cloning, with memories and consciousness being transferred from the parent, who has both male and female sex organs, to the offspring. Mating rituals also reportedly involve three individuals to contribute genetic material. While the novel The Sunder depicts Tholians as living only six to eight months, the novel Vendetta indicates that Tholians experience time differently from most humanoids, meaning that subjectively their lives are quite long. The Sundered also indicates that Tholians possess a form of networked intelligence on top of their individuality. This telepathic network is referred to as the Lattice and is distinguished from a normal hive mind in that Tholians can choose uh, who to share memories with. As far as their homeworld, Tholia, not much is known about it. Various reference materials characterize Thulia as being a Class N or Class Y planet with a toxic atmosphere, sulfuric deserts, and high temperatures right at home for them. Such planets may actually be quite abundant in the universe as we've cataloged plenty of exoplanets with temperatures hotter than Venus and Mercury. In any case, Thulia's atmosphere is also said to contain a chlorine methane compound. Methane is a type of hydrocarbon with a cosmic abundance similar to ammonia. In its liquid form, methane has been observed on the frozen surface of Titan and, like ammonia and sulfuric acid, is suspected to be a possible alternative solvent besides water for biochemical reactions. Other possible solvents include formamide, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen sulfide, liquid hydrogen and nitrogen, methyl alcohol, and sodium chloride, among others. But even in its gaseous form, methane is technically a greenhouse gas, and thus it may indeed function as a respiratory chemical in uh, environments with temperatures far too hot for Earth-like life. The interstellar government of the Tholians is known as the Tholian Assembly. Residing in the Alpha Quadrant, Tholian territory covers uh, hundreds of light years of space and includes systems such as Omicron Cephei. According to reference materials, it is the third largest entity in local space behind the Federation and Klingon Empire, with the Breen Confederacy coming in fourth. As we learned in Enterprise, until the 2150s, the Vulcan High Command had only limited contact with the Assembly, though this changes as Starfleet begins to venture closer to their space. The Tholians come off as aggressive and territorial on several occasions. They are known to annex systems beyond their core territories and kill outsiders who enter Tholian space without their consent. This would result in numerous conflicts, including surprise attacks on Federation and other targets. However, despite their relative isolationism and xenophobic reputation, Tholians are not completely unreasonable. For example, we see in the Tholian web that they allow the Enterprise NCC-1701 to retrieve James T. Kirk from the USS Defiant. That is, until the Enterprise's allotted time limit is up, and then they open fire. Indeed, the Tholians highly value punctuality as well as honesty and accuracy in their relationships. The seat of power of the Tholian Assembly, naturally, is Tholia. Star Trek star charts and stellar cartography depict Tholia as orbiting a B-type blue giant star, which, if true, does present some complications. You see, B-type stars are among the hottest in the known universe, and thus they burn through their hydrogen very quickly. As a consequence, they have very short lifespans, only millions of years, compared to the billions of years that our sun is expected to live. While well, life on Earth did appear within the first 850 million years of our planet's existence, this is actually far longer than the lifespans of many massive blue stars, which can burn out as quickly as 10 million years. Thus, if Tholia really does orbit a blue giant, while evolution could be faster due to more intense starlight, it's still incredibly likely, in my opinion, that the Tholians did not actually naturally evolve there. 
In fact, this is actually the explanation used in the Vanguard novel series. The Thulians were engineered by a mysterious race known as the Shedi about 100,000 years ago. The Shedi were non-humanoid shapeshifters with a similar genetic structure to the Tholians. Through the use of mind control, they used the Tholians as slave labor until the Shedi voluntarily went into hibernation. As far as their society, uh, various reference materials further describe the Tholians as having a caste society, with most Tholians encountered by Starfleet being part of the warrior caste. Novels depict their government as a federal republic, with various levels of bureaucracy headed by a high magistrate and governed by a ruling conclave. The Tholians' participatory collective consciousness ensures that every adult has at least some sway in government affairs, though the rigidity of the caste system still marks their society as distinctly authoritarian. Tholians are bred for specific purposes and trained from birth to perform various functions in their society. Tholians' tendency to annex systems beyond their core territories also sees them conquer humanoids and other intelligent life forms to serve as part of a labor class. This is first confirmed in canon in the Enterprise episode In a Mirror Darkly, and even though this episode takes place in the Mirror Universe, I think it's fair to say that the same social dynamic probably applies in the Prime Universe. It certainly does in the novels. Regardless of their internal politics and occasional skirmishes with other powers, however, the Tholians do engage in trade and diplomacy with their neighbors. Tholian ambassadors and observers have been mentioned uh, multiple times, including a diplomatic mission aboard Deep Space Nine. The Tholians do, however, sign a non-aggression pact with the Dominion, which invades the Alpha Quadrant in the 2370s. Presumably, relations between the Assembly and the Federation remain tense. Tholian starships are notably shaped like triangular prisms, and their small size makes them highly agile. They are outfitted with powerful weaponry, including energy dampening weapons that can render an enemy vessel completely powerless. These ships are also capable of generating a tractor field known as a Tholian web, which can trap vessels in a manner similar to the way spiders trap prey with their webs. It's actually a pretty cool design choice if you think about it, given that Tholians are often referred to as space spiders. Anyway, these webs are actually immune to outgoing weapons fire, such as photonic torpedoes, although ships outside the web can fire inside without hindrance. Also, the more ships available to spin the web, the faster it generates. The only way to escape one is to fire on one of the ships generating the field before it finishes. In addition to their spacefaring vessels and weapon systems, however, uh, one kind of technology that the Tholians do like to dabble in is one of a temporal nature. In fact, the Enterprise NX-01's first encounter with the Tholians in 2152 is after the Enterprise retrieves a small craft adrift in space that's apparently from the future. As the Tholians try to capture this time ship, this means that they could be a faction in the Temporal Cold War. For those unfamiliar, the Temporal Cold War is a conflict fought between various factions across centuries of history in an effort to manipulate the timeline to their own ends. I made a video years ago uh, providing an overview of the Temporal Cold War. Link in the description if you're interested. Warning, the audio's pretty bad. The Tholians' involvement in the Temporal Cold War uh, seems to be in opposition to the Suliban Cabal, although their involvement with any other faction is currently unknown. However, in Star Trek Online, the Tholians use the Tox Uthat, a quantum phase inhibitor, to destroy the Nakul star. The Nakul are, of course, the faction that temporarily allied with Nazi Germany in the Enterprise episode Stormfront. Bad dudes. One mission in Star Trek Online also describes the Tholians as being, quote, just as opportunistic and xenophobic, end quote, in the late 27th century, according to one Federation scientist. Thus, I think it's safe to say that the Tholians uh, are a species whose rigid customs 
perpetually put them at odds with the Federation, meaning that their capacity for membership is very limited, if not completely non-existent. They harbor a deep disdain for carbon-based life, though their adversarial nature doesn't preclude them from still conducting trade and diplomacy. So perhaps there's still hope for a peaceful, if rocky, future after all. The Tholians are clearly one of the most interesting species in Star Trek just from a pure design perspective. Their non-humanoid appearance and completely alien biochemistry makes them a rare gem, if you will, among the teeming swaths of humanoid carbon-based life in the Star Trek Milky Way. Their isolationism also makes them a more intimidating enemy, as they're only as involved in interstellar affairs as they choose to be. No one's forcing their hand, and they can easily ally with any of the Federation's enemies at any given time. They're playing the long game. They may be one of the last interstellar civilizations standing when all is said and done. There's also no doubt that they possess a keen interest in the inner workings of space-time. We know that they can manipulate interphasic fields to interact with parallel universes. So who's to say that they aren't aware of multiple possible futures and aren't receiving secret assistance from uptime factions in the temporal cold war? Something to think about. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun writing this one and putting it together. As always, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't yet subscribed, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support the channel even further, then becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those as well as my social media and merch store are in the description as well. That's about all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.